So what we're going to do in this first session, this is fairly, going to be a fairly quick presentation for, of what's new in version 9 of Design Life. So this was released uh, in the beginning of the year, in January. And so uh, hopefully a number of you already have version 9 installed. If you don't, it is available. Uh, so either talk to your IT department or talk to us and we'll provide it uh, to you. So we're going to go over what's new in the release. And just to, to set the scenes for those of you who, if you are less familiar with our product range, Encode Design Life is one of our three main products. Encode Design Life is all about being able to do fatigue analysis out of stresses and strains calculated from finite element simulations. So we're here we're talking about CAE durability prediction. That's, so that's going to be the main focus of today. Yesterday, we looked more at our two other products, Glyphworks, which is for signal processing, primarily, again, focused on durability. And we have automation, which is a web-based system for automating your analysis, distributing it uh, via the web in a controlled way. And also, just to point out the fact that we also have all of that ENCODE, Glyphworks, and Design Life uh, available with our CDS token system. That avoids you having to say, oh, I don't have that feature, or I don't have that product option. It's a token system, so you can run all of all of our software and the desktop version of automation. So what we're going to run through today in this next just 20 minute overview is some of the new capabilities in version 9. And we're going to be talking about seam weld analysis, what's new in terms of how to do an analysis of a seam weld, uh, looking at what's new in terms of uh, composites, what we've done there in version 9, an important, important subject for us going forward. What, we've, what we have added in the software with regards animation. So this is something that's completely brand new. We haven't done animations before in, in Design Life. So I will, we will touch on that now, and I'll do a demonstration of that uh, later on. A topic called load reconstruction, which we'll, again, we'll, we'll go into more details and then a few other minor enhancements. So this area of, of welding is, is, is a very important one. We recognize in a lot of our customer base particularly in the automotive industry, uh, but in other industries as well, because structural failures often occur at the joints. They often occur where you have welds. That, that just is an inherently uh, inherent weak part of, of uh, a, a, an assembled structure. And uh, with version 9, what, we've, what we have added is the capability to now analyze welds in, in solid models. So this, is, uh, this now en enables us to apply our seam weld analysis technique where you've got thicker parts coming together. And we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail this morning. The, pressure, the, the, the method that we've adopted here is actually based on a standard uh, from the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code um, that enables us to now take stresses out of a out of a solid model, out of an arbitrary, like a 10 mesh, extract a stress distribution through, through an arbitrary direction through the, through the model, and, um, and then calculate what a representative structural stress is for use in a, in a fatigue calculation. So previously, and Jeff is going to be talking more after, after this presentation about the, an overview of our capabilities for analyzing welds in, in design life. But Historically, you would have, or previously, you would have used thin shells. There's a cross section here. Thin shells to represent some kind of welded joint in a structure. And now we're an, actually enabling you to, to physically model it using a full uh, 3D solid model representation. And as I mentioned, we're, we're going to look at that in some more detail uh, uh, this morning. Another topic which is of, of interest to us, so welding is an area we're going to be continuing to move forward on, something we're going to focus on, providing new tools, new methods. Another area that we're going to be giving quite a bit of attention to is the area of composites. Uh, uh, that's, for, that's for a few reasons. We're seeing increased use, especially in the automotive industry. There's, there's a uh, light weighting of vehicles, reducing of weight out of vehicles is, is, is uh, becoming uh, increasingly um, necessary, and uh, composites also give 
uh, the ability to provide other, um, have other uh, merits. For example, things like carbon fiber, incredibly strong for its weight. And so the strength uh, and stiffness you can get from composites, as long as you can get it at the right price point, something that's actually manufacturable is going to be very attractive going forward for a lot of, a lot of industries. And, and they also have benefits in terms of what you can actually make out of these, out of, out of a composite. So there's an increasing trend that we see, and I'll be interested to hear your feedback. In fact, there's one of the questions there, if you didn't, feed, if you didn't respond yesterday, you weren't here yesterday, about how you see the role of composites uh, going forward. But we see them being increasingly used for, for actual, even structural components. So in version nine, we, we, in version eight, we added our first support for, for a short fiber composite fatigue analysis. In version nine, we've extended that to now, again, cover a broader range of applications. And similarly, we're supporting solid elements. So this means if you have, like, for example, some kind of um, uh, uh, injected uh, plastic component that's being made, uh, version 8, you could model that with a layered shell representation to, to, an, to represent the fiber orientation at the different uh, positions in that, in that structure. Uh, in this release, you can actually use a, a solid mesh. So you could have different solid elements in your, uh, in your, in your structure. So again, enables broader range of applications. One of the implications of doing that with solid elements if you can imagine, what we're analyzing here is at the element centroid of a finite element model. And the downside of analyzing in the middle of a solid element is that you have a full 3D state of stress. On the surface of a component, like in a shell model, your stresses are, are you have normal stress state. You have, you have, you have a zero uh, normal stress state. It's all, all your stresses are in the plane. With me? Yeah? which makes some of the calculations a little bit more straightforward. You know where well, you're, you're analyzing in just the plane of the surface. You're looking for cracks in the surface uh, in that plane. With a solid model, subsurface cracks are a possibility with composites. So you have to analyze the full all the way through the structure. And in a solid element, you've now got a full 3D state of stress. The, the, the principal stresses could be in any direction, not just in, the, not in a single plane. So we've had to extend our abilities for doing things like critical plane analysis and uh, multi-axial assessment to not just be as they typically are in a critical plane, single plane. We're now doing that on a full spherical coordinate system. So we're actually doing it in a full 3D uh, orientation. So that's one thing we've had to extend our methods in, to, in order to be able to do composites in, uh, in um, in version 9. So full 3D states of stress for multi-axial assessment and full 3D critical plane analysis. We're looking at, at, we're looking at fatigue results on a whole sphere of directions. And we are again using as a, a standard approach for composites, we're providing, uh, or you're providing uh, in most cases, a set of material curves that represent the fatigue performance depending on whether your fibers are aligned with the, with the, uh, with the loading or, or transverse, because the fatigue properties are going to be different depending on how the internal fibers inside your comp composite line up. Are you with me? So you provide uh, material data that says, here's what my SN curve looks like when they're aligned with the fibers. Here's what my SN curve looks like in another direction. You can provide multiple curves. And then the software does the interpolation to come up with what is the appropriate SN curve, material curve, for the fatigue calculation to use in every location on your model because it, it varies. And if you have other questions about you know, how, what our approach is, I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, but what we've also got in version 9 is we've actually worked with uh, e Extreme Engineering with their Digimat product. Now, Digimat is a material modeling software. And so what this enables you to do is actually, in a, it actually can calculate uh, what a uh, SN curve is, is for a particular location in the model. It's, it's a slightly more sophisticated way of, of doing what we do as, as, a, as a linear interpolation or an interpolation. It's using a material model 
to calculate what a representative SN curve should be for every location in your, in your composite. And so we have a link there to, to Digimat 4.4.1, uh, uh, I believe, is that latest version that contains, it has a, has a special ENCODE module that links to Design Life. And so Digimat doesn't do the fatigue calculation. Design Life's doing the fatigue calculation. But Digimat is providing effectively a uh, representative SN curve based on a material model. OK? So that's just what, if you're either you're interested in composites or you're using Digimat, that might be something you're interested in, 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 in finding more about. So in version 9, we've, we've also added a new capability for animating of results. So you can actually create um, a result set that you can then visualize. So there's a new animation uh, uh, capability, which I'm gonna, we'll do a short demo of later in the morning. So when you do a fatigue calculation, typically what you do is you take your stresses from your, your finite element model, you take some loading, you take some materials data, you do a calculation, and you end up with typically you know, some nice contour plot where you've got some hot spot where you've got your fatigue problem you need to fix, let's say. That's fine, but what do you do next? How do you solve that problem? Let's say you do that calculation, and you've got this hot spot, you've got this fatigue life that you know is not acceptable. How do you solve that problem? From an engineering point, point of view, what do you do? You could do some, you know, you could play some what if games, change some numbers. But oftentimes what you need to do is talk to the designer and say you need to change the design and do this. You need to make it stiffer in this place or, or less stiff in this place. You need, to, you need to redistribute the stresses in some way. And just making things thicker and heavier can even sometimes make matters worse. Okay, uh, So you need to know how to, how to solve the problem. So that's the, sometimes the challenge is just knowing, here's my result, here's my fatigue life, what do I do next? How do I improve my design? And so what, you, what is helpful to be able to do sometimes is to look at a critical loading condition that's causing uh, the response that you're seeing in terms of fatigue damage and actually to be able to, to visualize it. So you can actually see, in this case here, we can see a, um, a, a, um, a body structure. It's actually undergoing some uh, loads coming in through the front front shock tower causing a twisting motion. And so if that was generating, uh, let's say, say that was generating some problems up in the top of the uh, A pillar there, it might be helpful to be able to go in and, and as the loading is being applied in real time, to be able to go in then and visualize, okay, how is my structure deforming? Because that might tell you, okay, well, let's, let's try and uh, stiffen up this part or uh, change a, a section here if you can visualize how the, how the structure is responding to a, uh, to a particular input. So this is, a, this is just another tool to help when it comes to answer the question, okay, so now what? What do I do to, to solve this durability problem to help you uh, to animate it? What, what, uh, what we've seen is that companies have been doing this for a number of years anyway. And the way that they would have done it is that they would have gone through, they've done the fatigue calculation, identified when, say, critical locations in time were that were causing a lot of damage, extract what the simultaneous loads were at that instant in time, apply all those loads, go and rerun on a finite element model with those loads, and then do some kind of static animation just to say, OK, at that point, under load, this is how my structure is deforming, to get a visual picture of what, what's happening. So effectively, design life helps you take that a step further. It helps you do that, uh, but you could actually even do it for a whole section of points in time rather than just a single static subset. You actually be able to do the linear superposition of, of loading values to, to see how a structure is responding. And the way we do this is we actually have a new analysis engine that you can add into your setup in design life. And logically enough, it's called a, an animation engine. And so what that enables you to do is actually creates an animation file. 
it actually creates a file. It does the superposition, it brings the displacements, it reads the displacements, does superposition, and calculates it at every instant in time that you want it, what is the total deformed shape of your structure. Yeah, you, you following me? So this is particularly useful if you are doing, for example, either linear superposition. And most customers, for a lot of the jobs that they're running, that's what they're doing. They're running either a linear static and doing superposition, or you're running modal superposition. And, and, you can use, and I'll sh show you a demo later. I'm using a modal approach, visualizing a response due to a, a, a modal uh, analysis. So this avoids having to rerun the finite element job to get those, those deflections. And we're, we're also providing, and I'll run through this as a demo, uh, worked example number 21 that is new with version 9 to show how to, how to set all that up. So we're talking there about, say, running a linear superposition job. You are, you've got some stresses you've calculated in finite element. And you've also got some loading functions that you're now applying to those stresses to calculate at every instant in time what's the stress state that is being produced that you now want to calculate a fatigue result from. Now, all that assumes you know what these loads are. And what I see often in customers, it's, you know, people want to do more durability analysis, but what are, they either don't know the materials data or they don't know the loads. The finite element models, you guys are great at. Right? You guys love creating finite, finite element models. You can, you can run them. You can run them much bigger models, much faster than I used to be able to do when I, when I used to do it. Okay? <laughs> you can run these great big models. You get all these results. That's not the problem. The problem is, what's the materials data sometimes, and what's the loads that you should be applying? It's not always easy to, 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 to measure the types of loads that you actually need to drive your finite element models. We talked yesterday about one, one way of doing that is to use another simulation like a multi-body dynamics to calculate what loads are. Here's another way where you don't know the exact loads going into your part, but you can measure something. Maybe you can measure strain gauge measurements on certain parts of your component. You can't quite measure all the loads going in, but you can actually measure the strain response across a component. What we're going to show you later is what we've provided in version 9 for effectively back calculating what the loads must have been to generate those measured strains. So this is effectively using your component as a load transducer. Take measured strains you can measure in the field and then back calculate, OK, I've got these strains. What must have those loads been to generate those strains uh, in that component. And once you've back calculated those loads, now you can take those loads and run it through your finite element simulation to do a full field uh, fatigue calculation. Okay? So we're going to talk more about how we can recalculate those in-service loads from measured stresses and strains. And just a few other enhancements here, just to, just to, just to, uh, just to summarize some other features that are released in version 9. Here's one that has come up quite a few times from customers, which is uh, you've got this big model. You don't always want to analyze the whole thing. In fact, you might deliberately want to exclude certain parts of your model because you know around here I've got a whole bunch of rigid elements. And, and, and these nodes around here are just garbage. I, just, I, don't, I don't want those results cluttering my contour plot with these big, big red splodge that the manager's going to come in and say, well, wh what's wrong with this? And, and then you have to say, oh, no, 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 it's fine. It's just, it's just, it's just there's some rigids there or, or whatever. Um, so it can be quite helpful to be able to, to deliberately exclude small regions or certain nodes or elements out of your model prior to doing a fatigue calculation. Obviously, you can select big regions. You can select properties for, for, for a bigger uh, selection of, of data. But what we've done in version 9 uh, we've, all, we've had this capability to be able to have a, a subset and say, you know, exclude this list of nodes or elements. Uh, what wasn't very helpful was the fact you literally had to type that in. You know, it was like a comma-separated list of, uh, yeah, 
type these locations in and you can exclude them or just analyze those points. What we've done is just uh, extended that in version 9 to, to enable you to provide that either from a formatted ASCII file. So you could have a, you could have a, a program like, uh, for example, Hypermesh, create, dump out an ASCII file, and then point to that file and say, yeah, and don't analyze those points, or do analyze those points, whichever you prefer. And we also have the ability to, if you're familiar with the design life interface, things can come in on pipes in a flow. We can actually pipe in a table of, of, of uh, locations uh, not to analyze. So that can be helpful, as I mentioned, to, to exclude poorly modeled areas for, uh, for, a, for a more useful analysis result set. Another enhancement that we've done, we have a capability in Design Life to be able to perform back calculations. So it's one thing to go forward and say, okay, what's my fatigue life? It's 42, great. Another thing we can do is calculate, do a back calculation. What does this load have to be scaled by in order for my shortest result to be? 42, so we can do a back calculation. And, uh, and, that, and that can be used almost like a safety factor. You know, what's my margin of scale factor that I need to achieve a, a certain life? What we've done in version nine is we've actually set, you, you, as a user, you can now manually control the range of values to search in as part of that back calculation. Previously, you could set a, um, uh, an upper limit, but not a lower limit. And that default number was pretty high. So if you didn't know what you were doing, you just let the thing run, it would be searching all over the place for the whole model, trying to find what is an appropriate scale factor for that location to hit the target life. And that, that effectively was computationally very intensive. So what we've enabled this to do now is you can set a range. You know, Once it goes outside this kind of range that you're interested in, maybe a point, point 0.5 to 2 or point 0.2 to 5 or whatever sort of sort of scale factors you we might be vaguely interested in. Outside of that, as soon as it goes outside that, it says, oh, forget it. It's, it's outside the range of interest and moves on. Well, this major, makes a massive difference to the runtime for this analysis. So it really improves your, your throughput for, for a back calculation. And we've also enhanced, to go along with that, we've enhanced the FE display to then to, to uh, specifically identify regions where you know, it's given up and said you know, it's outside the range or below the range. And you'll see that colored specifically in the legend. So it's clear to you when you're looking at the results, did I find a result or, did it, or, did we, or was it just outside the range? Just a minor one just in terms of usability. We've added a, a, a progress bar. In the, if you pop open the messages window in Design Life, you're running a big job. You just want to have some idea how long it's going to take before this thing is going to finish. Is it 10 minutes? Is it 10 hours? Uh, now when a job is running, you pop open the message window, it'll give you an estimate. How long's left for, for, the, for the remainder of the job? Based on, you know, it's a bit like Microsoft. In other words, it's not very accurate. But, you know, it, it, gives, you, it, it gives you some feel for, for how long is, is left. I mentioned this one yesterday, but I think for this audience it's worth mentioning again, which is we can now directly read results out of uh, uh, MSC, um, software Adams product uh, the, uh, and the uh, motion solve, Alter mo motion solve. So these are multi-body dynamics where you're simulating maybe a vehicle moving on a proving ground, you're calculating loads, and um, we can now read those request files and those plot files out of that software directly in Glyphworks. And this can be really helpful because these files can be huge. They're big ASCII files, they're not particularly nice to work with, uh, and, and but we read them in as, as multi-channel time series data. You can read it in. You can drag it in just like any other time series. You can pick channels out of it. And, uh, and uh, that, that, I think, has got a lot of benefit for people that use both design life or speci specifically linking it with uh, these multi-body dynamics codes. And I thought I'd throw this one in as well. I think I did mention this one last year because it, we were working on it. It hadn't been released yet. This was released in the middle of last year, as you're probably aware, we do a major release at the beginning of the year, and then we typically do some kind of minor release, at least one, in the middle of the year. This came out in the middle of last year. So this is the ability to set up auto-elimination more easily inside of Design Life. So what do I mean by auto-elimination? This is where you're running an analysis in Design Life 
you've got a big model, you've got long loading functions, this thing's gonna run for hours. What you want to do is speed up this analysis so you're focusing just on those parts of the model where there's anything going on. You're looking at those areas where there's larger stresses, where there's more likely to be damage. Auto elimination enables you to do a two-pass analysis. In fact, manually you can set this up to be as many passes as you want. But uh, what we've provided here is a wizard setup where you can say, I want to set up this job with some form of auto elimination, which means the first analysis it's going to do is a quick one. It's going to do some kind of uh, either method for selecting just a subset of locations in your model to focus on on a more detailed analysis. So how would we do that? For example, what we might do is you've got a big model, you've got a really long loading function. What it might do is say, let's have a let's let's peak valley slice those time series right down. Let's shorten those time series to just, just a few loading points. That means I can run through the whole model really quickly. Do a quick calculation to calculate damage on the, on the whole model. Find those more damaged locations and only reanalyze those more damaged locations uh, using the full loading time series. Okay, So the thing that's new or was new in, in the uh, in-service release for 8 is you will now if you right click on, a, on the run level, in the, if you go to the uh, advanced edit, open the tree structure, under analysis runs, you right mouse click on a run that's defined there, there is a, there's a right mouse option that says auto elimination. And it steps you through this adding of, asks you some questions, how do you want to speed it up, what's important to you, how many results do you want to keep, and, and then it will automatically insert that additional run, uh, additional analysis above the main analysis. So that's, that's very useful in practical terms. It's, it's one thing to, to run a job faster, and in version 7 we, we basically made design life four times faster. Um, uh, but it's also another thing to just do, do, the, do the analysis more smartly. Well, this is one way to do your analysis more smartly. Uh, but talking about performance, because I think this is my, that was the last slide. Oh, no, there's one more. Well, talking about performance, um, uh, one of the things, we, we don't talk a whole lot about futures at, at these kind of events. We'd like to tell you what we've done, not promise you things that we haven't done yet. So <laughs> that, tends to be our, that tends to be our focus of, of all the things we have been working on. But I did just want to mention one thing that we are working on right now, which will be coming out mid-year, which is a clustered version of design life. So for either distributed processing across multiple computers or in a Linux uh, HPC type environment, uh, we, we will be releasing that uh, all, all, all going well uh, later this year. So if that's again of something of interest to you, you know, come and talk to me about that. Uh, obviously that has the potential of taking what can be a very time consuming design life job by splitting it across tens or even hundreds of processing nodes, you can get, obviously, orders of magnitude speed up for these real huge design life jobs. So if that's something of interest to you, I'd, be, I'd, like, to, uh, I'd like to speak to you about that as well. And just to update you on, on supported file versions, that's one thing we have to keep doing. We have, we have people in, in, in our development team that literally this is all they do. They work on creating test cases for the new versions of of, of software that come in, make sure the results are all are stacking up, creating automated tests for it. Um, uh, and uh, so these are the latest versions that we support, including Abacus uh, 6.12.2 and uh, ANSYS uh, 14.5. It probably is worth pointing out, we are, we are moving ahead with our support of our, uh, Radios uh, H3D. That's uh, something that we're incrementing, adding a new file format is always a challenge for us. It's a lot of work to add a new FB solver. And uh, we're at, we do support, at a, in version 9, we support version 11. We're actually working on 12 right now for, for H3D. And we say it's a beta feature, which means you can turn it on manually and it will work. But we've really only validated it for the regular stress and strain, sort of uh, solid and shell type analysis. We haven't, we have not, we're currently working on it for you know, more advanced methods like vibration, fatigue, welding, 
those things we haven't, we're still working on validating all that. But you can do straightforward stress and strain life analysis with, with Radios files. And that was it. Any questions?